So I got Labyrinth on DVD, popped it in, sat down, and my reaction was... Um... Right, so the goal of this essay is, let's try and understand it. We don't know, but they do. I'm here right now. No, I said hello, but that's close enough. If you break down the film, Act 1 is about Jennifer Connelly being an ungrateful kid looking to escape from her comfy but boring middle class life and baby brother. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful young girl whose stepmother always made her stay home with the baby. But then David Bowie appears to make her wish come true and take little Toby away. Please bring him back, please. Act 2 is The Labyrinth in Labyrinth, where Jennifer Connelly must venture through the labyrinth to get him back. Well, come on feet. Her initiation involves talking to doors, a wall of hands, a bird guy, friendly giants, dude on a dog, more talking doors, and an all-out assault on a village populated by puppets. <laughs> to say that a couple of double takes would be an understatement. Act 3, Jennifer Connelly returns to Bowie. <laughs> David Bowie's defeated, the baby is back, everyone has a party in her bedroom, making the event somewhat ambiguous. Should you need us? Yes. Should you need us? So, as a result, the story is about growing up and appreciating the smaller things in life effectively. But let's get deeper, everyone. And when I say deeper, I mean go on Google Scholar for an afternoon. Burns and Burns argue that the whole film is about anti-consumerism and overconsumption. Jennifer Connelly is unhappy because her materialistic consumer lifestyle has eroded away her ability to find fulfillment in human relationships. It's very tragically relatable. They specifically argued, Henson illustrates how large homes extend the distance between family members and negatively impact familial relationships. It is in Sarah's parents' simple, clean and uncluttered room, a room with few consumer goods, that Sarah begins to realize the importance of human relationships. It is that I don't appreciate what you're trying to do for me, but I want my brother back. He must be so scared. Sarah. Furthermore, they argue Junk Lady is analogous of how recurring commercials are in distracting us from our families because Junk Lady literally tries to seduce Jennifer Connolly with a recreation of her bedroom with all of her material possessions restored. Here's your panda slippers. You know how much you like your panda slippers. Yeah, there they are. That's right. That's right. Okay, now then, what else? Subsequently, Jennifer Connolly is only free when she realizes that these items are junk and destroy her box, which is the ultimate material representation of herself. This action is then mirrored by the ballroom sequence, when she breaks through a mirror to break the overconsumptive environment. Paraphrase from page 10 to 12. The junk world further anchors this interpretation for the reason that it is precisely where Jennifer Connolly learns of the dark consequences of overconsumption. Ew. Oh. <sighs> pollution and waste. Therefore, Labyrinth, deep down inside, is a story that holds a mirror to the audience and encourages them to reflect on their lives as consumers and as human beings looking for fulfillment with deep emotional relationships. However, there's another interpretation. Shiloh Caro argued the film is about dream visions. Labyrinth's protagonist, Sarah, matures by several years in a matter of hours after traveling through a fantastic labyrinth in a world populated with fuzzy creatures and a sinister yet sensual Goblin King. While Labyrinth does not exactly conform to the formula of dream visions as used by medieval poets, it contains many of the same elements, such as the nature of the dreamer, the dream guide, and allegorical figures. You know your problem. You take too many things for granted. <laughs> Furthermore, Shiloh describes Jennifer Connolly as representative of a thin boundaried personality type, which as Hartman and Kusendorf defined, is a person with very little division in their psychological processes. Therefore, they can be immersed into daydreaming so much that they have difficulty distinguishing real life and fantasy. She treats me like a wicked stepmother in a fairy story no matter what I say. I'll talk to her. Subsequently, the profile of thin boundaried individuals tend to be creatively minded people like artists and music students. Jennifer Connolly conforms to this because she loves role-playing and her dramatic behavior is inherited from her actor mother. Furthermore, Carol suggests Jennifer Connolly fits into the traditional depiction of thin boundaried heroes. For my will is as strong as yours, and my kingdom is as great. 
Medieval dream visionaries were often in a state that necessitated intervention from an outside source. Turn back before it's too late. I can't. Some, such as Chaucer's Duchess narrator, are having trouble sleeping. Dante's pilgrim has fallen into a state of sin. The narrator of Pearl has experienced the death of his daughter. Nearly every dream visionary has some emotional trouble that they cannot solve himself. He is in need of guidance and advice that he cannot find in the physical world, so his mind conjures a setting in which he can find what he needs. Everything that you wanted, I have done. You asked that the child be taken. I took him. The dreams and those in them teach the visionaries necessary and important lessons to help them move through their current crises. In Labyrinth, at first, Jennifer Connolly learns to ask for help. She originally demanded information from Hoggle. Would you go left or right? Which way would you go? I wouldn't go either way. If that's all the help you're going to be, you can just leave. She assumes he's being rude and snaps at him. However, when she learns from a tiny blue worm, she gets the information she should have gotten from Hoggle if she just simply asked for clarification instead of acting like an asshole. What was that? I said, don't go that way. Never go that way. Oh. Thanks. The second lesson, Jennifer Connolly learns that life isn't fair, kids. The labyrinth is designed against her. The wall move, the tiny inhabitants change her marks, and Jareth takes away some of the allotted time. It's not fair. You say that so often. I wonder what your basis for comparison is. Finally, the last lesson, Jennifer Connolly learns that material possessions are not important as people. She gives Hoggle her bracelet, gives the unhelpful Oracle one of her rings despite Hoggle's protest. You didn't have to give him that. He didn't tell you nothing. As a result, collectively in every trial, Jennifer's dream vision is a learning experience because the more she engages with those around her, the more she learns and is guided. May we have your permission? Well, I, uh, uh, yes. Thank you, noble sir. My lady. It's the opposite to Twitter. Correspondingly, all the characters can also be interpreted as personifications for different aspects of Jennifer Connolly's psychology. Since a dream vision is an internal journey through the dreamer's mind, it is reasonable to assume that the characters are facets of the dreamer himself. David Bowie poses like Prince Charming, the fairy tale archetype. Look, Sarah. Look what I'm offering you. Your dream. However, he's really a demon lover that tempts Jennifer with her own identification as a fairy tale princess. Moreover, Hoggle represents self preservation. He's a coward who runs away from danger. However, he returns to rescue Jennifer Connolly at the end. I forgive you, Hoggle. You do? Ludo represents the untarnished loyalty that is so compassionately pure that he's incapable of cynical thought. As Caro said, his ability to communicate with rocks indicates a rapport with the most basic form of nature, the ground itself. That's incredible, Ludo! My brother! Canst thou summon up the very rocks? And finally, the Fire Gang represents irresponsibility. Their song, Chilly Down, contains the lyrics Don't got no problems, ain't got no suitcase, ain't got no clothes to worry about, ain't got no real estate or jewelry, or gold mines to hang me up, ain't got no copyright strike because ain't using the actual song. Therefore, when they try to drag Sarah into their freedom that they supposedly enjoy, she's unable to relate because this symbolizes her growth into adulthood. As a result, all the characters are effectively measurements for Jennifer's maturation and improving mental health. As Carol summarized, Henson has shown the normal maturing of a young woman in a compressed form at a dream vision to metaphorically and allegorically explore the trials that young girls must endure to become women. How about my perspective? Well, after having thoroughly read through both papers, my personal interpretation is that everything is connected. Labyrinth's representation of consumerism in dreams shows us that there's a pattern of wants that influence the stories of the old and therefore the story of our own lives now. The world in the film creates a poetic symmetry between the literary myths of dreamers that we're all familiar with and the lonely resentment that comes with modern consumer values. As a result, we're shown that consumer culture itself is a dream. 
one that is as ephemeral, impatient, and confrontational as the journeys of thin boundaried heroes. Therefore, our own minds, dreams, and daydreams is where we do battle now, to negotiate, to fight, to liberate ourselves from the commercial imagination, and to find our place with those around us. I mean, I know it's a bit of a cop-out conclusion, but... In summary, I think I have an alright understanding of this film. Yeah. Old enough to have a marriage and to not wind up in a mental hospital. Thank you.